Okay, terrific. Um, well, thanks so much, Jacob, for uh, organizing this wonderful workshop. I've learned a lot already, and it's a great pleasure to be uh, to be speaking here. This is a joint work with uh, with Kelvin McQueen. We've been working on this for a number of years now. We recently put an article with the same title as the talk online, which I pasted into the uh, chat. If anyone wants to uh, follow along, this is just going to be hitting some of the uh, some of the high points. I'll speak for about 20 minutes, um, just uh, providing some informal motivation, and Calvin will go into um, more depth on some of the details in the, uh, in the second half. This project really lies uh, at the intersection of the uh, foundations of physics and of the, and the philosophy of mind. Given the group and our topic today, I'll stress motivations coming from the, uh, the foundations of physics, although um, although uh, the philosophy of mind will come in along the way. So start with our, our main topic, the measurement problem. Um, and here's a standard formulation of quantum mechanics. There's the Schrodinger equation and there's collapse on measurement, at least as an empirical apparatus. There are many versions of many definitions of the measurement problem, but one very obvious measurement problem, one very obvious and core problem about measurement arises for this apparatus taken as an account of reality, what on earth is measurement? It's ill-defined, it's imprecise, and it's unsuitable for a role in physical theory. These are sentiments that have been um, uttered by many. Responses at, uh, at this point, standard response. You know, response one is ignore the problem, shut up and calculate, forget about reality, we have a successful empirical theory, or uh, response two, much more popular in this, particular, this local crowd, the foundations of physics, uh, look for new interpretations that do away with the notion of measurement entirely. So Everett, Bohm, cubism, really are just, you know, it's a, they basically have different dynamics, even spontaneous collapse interpretations. They keep collapse, but they um, dispense from the idea that collapse happens upon a special triggering event. Um, call it measurement, if you like. They just happen spontaneously and randomly. And I think there's a, there's a third response, uh, which you would have think would have been explored more than it has been, and which we're inclined to, uh, to explore here, which is when you're faced with an imprecise or ill-defined notion at the heart of your theory, then precisify it, make it precise, replace it by something more precise, replace it by something better defined, and so on. Of course, there are gonna be many options, um, in doing that, but then that, that option is, is basically gonna give you a class of theories worth looking at. Um, so the basic idea here is what we call measurement collapse interpretations. This is the broad class we're concerned with. Keep the standard Schrodinger plus collapse dynamics, but replace measurement, the criteria for collapse with some more precise criterion for collapse. As a result, you'll get a whole family of measurement collapse interpretations depending on the precisification. Furthermore, it turns out that many, you know, the members of this family actually turn out to be empirically distinguishable in principle. So if not easily in practice, um, so as a result here, you might see, okay, what we have basically here is a free parameter in our theories, which is uh, empirically testable in any case. So our broad project before we bring in consciousness is just to see if we can investigate this class of measurement collapse interpretations with measurement precisified. But the specific approach that we take is to bring in consciousness. At this point, of course, it gets all the more controversial. Measurement is controversial enough. Uh, consciousness is, is even more controversial. Everyone is familiar with the idea uh, that's out there that consciousness plays a core role in collapsing the wave function is extremely unpopular these days, um, you know, partly, partly perhaps because of its association with various, you know, spiritual worldviews and the like, but also partly because it's not clear that it's ever really been developed properly into a proper dynamics. I mean, the idea is most closely associated with Wigner in his 19, 1961 piece on the mind-body question. You can argue that it's in von Neumann or in London and Bauer, there are at least interesting connections to consciousness uh, drawn there. In recent years, Henry Stapp and others have, have tried to develop it. 
But here the idea is you, know, you take that idea of precisifying measurement and precisify it in terms of consciousness, understand measurement in terms, in some way, in terms of interaction with consciousness. Now, why? Okay, why would you do that? I mean, from a, from I guess from a just a straight physics viewpoint, the case is under determined. I mean, one motivation is that conscious observation is a natural understanding of measurement. One slightly more substantive motivation is that understanding measurement and consciousness does a particularly good job of saving the saving the phenomena, which is somehow concerns our the basic phenomena here with quantum mechanics is our our observations seem always to be determinate. Our conscious observations seem to be determinate so that understanding measurement in terms of consciousness can do that. It's not the only interpretation which can do which can do that, but it's um, but it's at least a, a very natural interpretation for doing that. I think to bring in further motivations for consciousness collapse interpretations, you need to start thinking about consciousness and issues in the philosophy of mind in their own right. One major issue for any theory of consciousness is to find a causal role for consciousness in the physical world. And this is a notoriously ill understood question. Um, having consciousness play a core role in collapse offers the possibility of a causal role for consciousness in the physical world, one that seems to be entirely compatible with physics as we understand it. So that opens up, opens up the dream of solving the measurement problem for, of quantum mechanics and the interaction problem about consciousness and the mind-body problem at once. So for a philosopher of mind, that's attractive. If furthermore, you're inclined to think that consciousness involves something fundamental in the world as, as at least I do, then there's some, some extra motivation for looking for this special role for consciousness here, if there's going to be some special trigger for a collapse, all the more attractive if it's something fundamental. That said, even if you're not into, uh, into consciousness specifically, I'd like to think that quite a lot of what we say in this talk can be taken over just for thinking about interpretations of quantum mechanics that precisify measurement and don't necessarily bring in consciousness. But, you know, I'm a, I'm a philosopher of mind and Kelvin is a is a combination of a philosopher of mind and a philosopher of physics. So we're especially interested in this motivation. Now you might think, okay, how is moving to consciousness any progress here at all? Measurement was imprecise. Consciousness is, uh, is just as imprecise too. Um, well, I mean, at this point, I think there's room to disagree. It's been actually argued by many people, both in philosophy and science, that phenomenal consciousness, the core notion of consciousness here, subjective experience, what it's like, uh, to perceive, feel, and think is actually precise. You're either phenomenally conscious, you're not. At any given point, your phenomenal consciousness is a precise state. Furthermore, there now exist mathematically precise models of phenomenal consciousness. They're by no means perfect or uh, uncontroversial, but they exist. Um, one well-known example is Tononi's integrated information theory of consciousness, which gives fairly precise conditions for the existence and the degree of consciousness in a, uh, in a system, and furthermore, gives an account of its precise structure. Um, you know, some people say that worry that bringing in consciousness somehow requires a form of dualism. Now, from my own perspective, that's not such a bad thing. I think there's a serious motivations for a form of property dualism about consciousness with consciousness being irreducible to something physical. But if you don't agree about that, I think nothing about, nothing in this framework requires dualism. The framework we're gonna develop, you can identify consciousness say with some physical property, maybe like a, some, kind of some kind of network property, some kind of integrated information property. You could take a metaphysical view where consciousness is identical to that property and collapses wave functions, everything we say will still apply. I mean, maybe the dualist has a bit of extra motivation by the interaction problem, but this is a framework which is equally open to the, uh, to the materialist about consciousness. Okay, so that's just some background motivation um, for pursuing this project. But really, I think that we think the big problem for both measurement collapse interpretations and especially for consciousness collapse interpretations is not precision, it's not anthropomorphism, it's not any of those things. It's the big problem is actually giving a powerful, a precise and powerful account of the dynamics. As far as we know, no one has really done that 
in a detailed way for a consciousness collapse interpretations. It stayed a vague idea. It hasn't been cashed out with dynamical principles in the way that um, all of the other core interpretations of quantum mechanics have. So our project is to use uh, mathematical tools, to use mathematical model of consciousness and a mathematical dynamics of collapse to make a consciousness collapse interpretation as clear and precise as possible to minimize unclarities in order to make the approach precise enough to be assessed. That's our project. Very important to note, we are not asserting that this, um, the interpretation we're laying out today is correct. I think we're probably both a little bit inclined to be skeptical of that. Uh, we're merely exploring this, uh, this interpretation. I mean, we're actually both very sympathetic with other, other interpretations. Uh, I wrote something defending the Everett interpretation 25 years ago, and I'm still quite sympathetic with it. Kevin Kelvin has co-authored with Lev in defense of many worlds. So we're merely exploring the view because we think it's worth taking seriously. And it should be said, our results end up being somewhat mixed. At the beginning, I had very high hopes that uh, you know this could go in interesting directions. In the end, we we came across some limitations, but we want to, you know, basically make the account precise so that it can be assessed and so we can see whether it's possible to do better. Okay, so the guiding idea behind the approach we take to consciousness or measurement and its role in collapse, there's various starting points you can use here, but there's one that's been quite, uh, it's already been around in discussions of this idea, although I don't know if it's really been made precise. And this is the idea that consciousness somehow resists superposition. There's something special about consciousness so that consciousness does not enter superpositions and this plays some special role in the collapse process. I think you can actually find this idea very briefly in Vigna's 1961 paper, where he says, you know, this couldn't, you couldn't have a superposition of consciousness that would be like suspended animation. You can find the idea in David Albert, who's certainly not a friend of the theory, but trying to make sense of the idea somehow the physical correlates of consciousness are always are always collapsed to an eigenstate. And I explored this idea very briefly in something about 20 years ago, now just in a footnote. And you know, this project partly, partly comes from trying to make this idea more detailed and precise. I mean, the rough idea is that consciousness, I mean, the rough, the broad approach here is to find some special operators or observables that resist superposition. So that physical systems are constrained to be in corresponding eigenstates or something or at least something very close to that. Um, you know, think of those as measurement devices, if you like. But here, doing it with consciousness, the core idea is that consciousness resists superposition, or at least the physical correlates of consciousness, what I'll call the PCC. Neuroscientists talk about the NCC for the neural correlates of consciousness, but we'll be a bit broader here. But the physical correlates of consciousness are superposition resistant. If, if we're a materialist and we say consciousness is the PCC, all the better. Otherwise, you know, some consciousness resists superposition, and therefore the physical correlates of consciousness resist superposition. This then comes in a couple of different, this idea comes in a couple of different versions. What we'll call absolute super resistance is the strongest version, says that consciousness cannot enter superpositions at all, and nor can the nor can the physical correlates of consciousness. This corresponds to the familiar idea of a super selection rule. A super selection rule is something that says that certain observables um, cannot enter superpositions and that systems are constrained to be in corresponding eigenstates. It's interesting actually that the original paper on super selection rules was co-authored by Wigner in 1952 and grew out of a, a paper of his in 1951. As far as I know, he never actually connected this idea to his ideas about about consciousness and was actually was somewhat skeptical that super selection would play a key role in addressing the measurement problem. Nonetheless, this must be an interesting story there to be told. You know, the rough idea then about how um, measurement could work, say, measure your, say you've got an electron in a superposition of location, superposition of states S1 and S2, then we, uh, we consciously perceive it. The state of the electron gets entangled with the state of the brain potentially yielding a superposition, S1 followed by S1 along with perceiving S1 
plus S2 along with perceiving S2 at the level of consciousness and its physical correlates. Ah, but that would be a, a superposition of consciousness, which can't happen. Our super selection rule uh, rules it out. So by the Born rule, consciousness collapses probabilistically to, to one of these. Uh, and the result is a definite state of being conscious of the electron being in one position and the electron itself being in that position. So that's how familiar story about how super selection could bring about collapse. Um, furthermore, you know, the physical correlates of consciousness will collapse. Its role, as its connection to action will be, will be made correspondingly determinate. So you can actually see a causal role for consciousness in this, uh, in this process. This is just at the level of things being very informal. Unfortunately, there's a, at least for the strong version of this, the absolute super selection, there's an absolutely immediate and fatal problem. The kind, the version here, which involves absolute super selection rules where you always have to be in a eigenstate of the relevant, uh, the relevant operators um, is subject to a problem we call the Zeno problem. It's a kind of, a, both because it's a kind of problem of the impossibility of motion and because it can be associated with the quantum Zeno effect, um, basically super selection observables can't change their values. They're constrained. If you're, if you're in an eigenstate of those observables with a given eigenvalue, then you're always going to be in corresponding eigen, eigenstate with the same eigenvalue. Um, that's just a mathematical fact. I mean, one way to bring it out is that the dynamics of, of this you know, super selection of um, of a given observable is as if that observable was being continuously measured, you know, by God or somebody on a standard measurement picture, and therefore, therefore, could never enter superpositions. And we know the dynamics of strong continuous measurement does not allow variation. That would have the consequence then that the physical consciousness can never change its values. For example, from being unconscious to being conscious, or from being conscious in one way to being conscious in another way. That's obviously a fatal consequence. Consciousness can't get started in the early universe, for example. You never go from no consciousness to some. Furthermore, you can't wake up from a nap. Um, you know, if you're sleeping there, no consciousness, and you want to regain consciousness, sorry, you're going to be stuck. Every time a little bit of consciousness blinks into existence on some branch, bing, it gets knocked out with probability one. Okay, so that um, is not going to work. Instead, instead, what we need is uh, what we'll call approximate super resistance. Consciousness, or at least the physical correlate of consciousness, tends to, tends to resist superposition and collapses towards eigenstates, but this is not an absolute constraint. It's a, uh, it's a probabilistic constraint with its own, with its own dynamics. And this has one big downside, which at least where consciousness is concerned, it requires us to to, uh, to give up on that constraint that consciousness is never superposed and to allow at least small superpositions of states of consciousness. Small in the, stent, in the sense that they won't be long lasting and high amplitude and superpositions of very different states. Um, but nonetheless, you might say, okay, it's not easy to make sense of that. It's not something that we have introspective familiarity with. So I think this is definitely this is definitely a cost, but there is also an upside here, which is there is a very nice available dynamics for approximate super resistance. Um, basically, um, you take something like the familiar dynamics of continuous spontaneous localization developed by Philip Pearl and others, uh, standardly developed with mass density operators. What gets uh, what gets uh, local? What is super resistant is is mass density. Things collapse at least slowly towards. Um, eigenstates of mass density. Um, just generalize that to, it's also well known that you can generalize that to arbitrary operators. So just take the continuous collapse dynamics for an arbitrary operator, it's going to involve continuous collapse towards eigenstates of those operators and apply that to the physical correlates of consciousness. And you'll get a very nice mathematical picture of what we're calling approximate super resistance. So that's the approach that we want to pursue. Um, the overall dynamics then ends up involving a continuous CS CSL style, continuous spontaneous localization style collapse, but not onto a mass density basis as happens in 
in TSL and most collapse interpretations, but onto what we'll call a consciousness basis. And here the idea is that a consciousness basis will be given by a set of, by you know, one or more commuting operators, uh, which correspond to what we think of as the uh, physical correlate of consciousness. Consciousness is multidimensional, so presumably it's not just going to be a single scalar um, operator. Consciousness is a high dimensional, um, high dimensional quality, high dimensional quantity. Um, and the consciousness basis is going to be, you know, given by the operators corresponding to those. That, if these are proper observables, there are going to be Hermitian operators corresponding to these. Um, then we'll use those commuting operators inside the CSL style dynamics for a continuous collapse. So basically, the idea is that, you know, um, the physical correlates of consciousness can evolve into superpositions, but there's going to be very strong pressure for them to collapse towards eigenstates. As our mathematical theory of consciousness here, of the physical correlates of consciousness, we'll use Tononi's integrated information theory, or IIT, which I mentioned before, which is quite well known, which does in fact represent consciousness as a high dimensional quantity, and that can be made that can be turned into quantum mechanical um, Tononi's key high dimensional quantity, which he calls Q shape for a qualia shape can actually be turned into quantum mechanical operators. The basis for that um, has already been given by uh, Johannes Kleiner who's here in his work with, um, I forget his first name, Tal, also another paper by Zanardi et al and what they call quantum IIT, where they basically take IIT and make it applicable, not just to classical systems, but to quantum mechanical systems. Turns out from there, they don't, they don't take a collapse approach, but from there, it's not too difficult to define operators and to uh, feed those operators into a CSS, CSL style collapse onto um, the corresponding basis. So the basic, just keeping this at the informal level then, the basic picture we're left with is a kind of mashup of Wigner, Pearl, and Tononi. Um, and others, you know, there's a, again, there's a mathematical theory of consciousness and a mathematical theory of collapse. The mathematical theory of consciousness, we basically take over from Tononi. Consciousness um, correlates with this high dimensional quantity Q shape, which can in principle be defined as a network property, ultimately grounded in physical terms. So Q shape, consciousness, covary. We have a principle that consciousness stochastically resists superposition. Wigner thought it absolutely resists superposition. That turns out not to work out, but we can make it stochastically resist superposition by applying the Pearl style dynamics of continuous spontaneous um, localization. So then consciousness, so the basic idea is, you know, consciousness resists superposition. There's a very strong tendency for determinate states of consciousness. The physical correlates of consciousness will correspondingly resist superposition. And so will everything it gets, gets entangled with. So basically mathematical theory of consciousness plus Dynamical theory of collapse gives you a rather nice, rather interesting, at least mathematics for the role of consciousness in collapse. So now at this point, Kelvin will take over and go into more depth about the details. Okay, can I just check that uh, you can hear me okay and that the screen looks good? Good. Okay. Okay. So, um, uh, sorry, one second. Okay. So, as Dave has explained, we want to model the super resistance of consciousness by adapting uh, Philip Pearl's CSL model. Uh, so now, in Pearl's model, consciousness doesn't play any role at all. Sorry. It doesn't play any role at all. Uh, instead, mass density is super resistant. So superpositions of mass density gradually collapse towards mass density eigenstates. The greater the mass density difference, the faster the collapse. So I'll present some equations for this in just a moment. Um, but first, it's uh, useful to consider an analogy with uh, the classical gambler's ruin game that um, Pearl uses to motivate his model. So imagine that we've got two gamblers, we'll call them uh, gambler G1 and gambler G2. 
Uh, G1 has $36 and um, G2 has $64. And they always have $100 in total, always. Um, Uh, so they always have $100 in total always. So they're going to play these games with a fair coin. So first game, uh, if you get heads, then G1 is going to give a dollar to G2. And if it's tails, then G2 is going to give a dollar to G1. Um, now they're going to keep playing this game and eventually either G1 or G2 will acquire $100. So eventually either G1 or G2 will win. Um, crucially, G1 is going to win 36% of the time and G2 will win 64% of the time. And so importantly, the probability is going to be given by the initial stakes. Um, now compare this with the following quantum state so now we can imagine that G1 and G2 are two different mass density distributions. So perhaps G1 is a mass density distribution corresponding to uh, Schrodinger's cat being alive, and G2 is a mass density distribution corresponding to Schrodinger's cat being dead. Um, so if mass density is super resistant, then this is an unstable state. It should collapse after some time. And what we are to imagine is that the state vectors in the superposition effectively gamble their squared amplitudes. And moreover, we can come up with some equations that can manipulate the rate in which the games are played, so to speak. So um, we can speed up the collapse with certain parameters um, if we want. Okay. Um, can everyone hear me okay? I just didn't get a response on the, on the chat before. Is that... I can hear you fine. Yeah. Your slides are a bit weird. Oh, they're still weird? Okay. Oh. Is it? Is it? I mean, if it's okay. something blocking your slides, at least for me, a big what, what square. Wanna... Uh, please make a full screen mode. I think it's, it's good to use full screen mode. Okay. Um, I jumped to PDF. This is it's because I'm using a PDF, which I don't normally use to present because we had some technical difficulties earlier. So how do I go view? Do you have a Chromat reader? Full screen mode. Try it. Does that look better? Hmm. Try advancing the slide. Yeah. How's that? It's bad. There's a little thing at the bottom. I think part of your screen is blocking it, but it's only very thin. It's not a big deal. OK. If it's too bad, maybe you could uh, share the version that you have, Dave. OK. You sent it to me? OK. I'll check. Yeah, you keep going, and I'll, I'll see if I can do that. OK. My apologies for that, everyone. OK. So um, here are some equations, which I'm hoping you can see OK. Um, so we've the got equations are coming through all right. We can see them. It looks good. OK, great. So we've got equations one and equation two. So um, equation two, um, Philip Pearl's mass density collapse model is an example of um, equation two, as is the, the DOC Penrose uh, gravity-based collapse model. So I mean, there's some details there at the bottom of the slide that um, shows you know, the, how certain, certain things are defined slightly differently between the different examples of uh, the mass density collapse models. Um, but I actually want to focus more on equation one. So equation one, which we've taken from uh, Bassi et al, a paper called Gravitational Decoherence. Um, this is written as to be neutral as to which property resists superposition. So just A hat is the collapse operator. Collapse happens in the basis of this collapse operator. Um, lambda is a, a variable that, uh, sorry, it's a constant that also contributes to collapse rate. And then WT, that's the uh, noise function that is responsible for the gambler's ruin behavior. Okay, so the thought is, yeah, you can um, put just about any operator in for a hat, and then in the basis of that operator, you'll see this gambler's ruin behavior obtaining, and that's how you uh, generate continuous collapse. So for us, if we want to adapt this, we want to find a consciousness operator, something that we can define as, as clearly and as rigorously as we can so that we can plug in for a hat. Although uh, common to equation two, we are going to need multiple 
collapse operators. Okay, so how are we going to do that? So we need a theory of consciousness and the theory of consciousness that we go with is Tononi's integrated information theory of consciousness. Um, why do we go with that for? Not because we think it's true. Um, it's pretty early days yet in the theory, in the, in the science of consciousness. Um, current theories are unlikely to be final theories. Nonetheless, um, IAT is useful. Um, it's perhaps the only theory of consciousness developed yet that is um, going to be capable of providing something like a collapse operator. Um, it's relatively mathematically precise. It purports to be completely general. Um, there are certainly some limitations here, in fact. Um, the systems that it applies to is, is somewhat limited. I'll come back to that in a moment. Um, nonetheless, for the systems that it applies to, it offers a mathematical measure of the amount of consciousness in a system, which it labels with big phi. And it also offers a mathematical model of a system's total state of consciousness, which as Dave mentioned is the so-called Q shape of the system. Um, in addition, it also gives a distance measure between Q shapes. So you can talk about how different two Q shapes are. And so if you've got a superposition of two Q shapes that are very different, then you can uh, you know, uh, adapt the equations so that that superposition collapse faster. Um, so I mentioned there's some limitations to the theory. Um, its systems are finite dimensional discrete Markovian networks. So networks, for example, neural networks, the kind of networks that um, neuroscientists work with. So obviously this is a limitation, although the advocates of this theory think that this is um, just a limitation that we have now, and there's certainly people working on extending this theory. We're going to extend this in a moment to quantum mechanics, although then we're still restricted to um, quantum networks. So ultimately what we need is a map from physical systems to network systems, and we're just going to presuppose that for the purposes of this talk. Um, it's worth saying something just briefly about experimental tests, um, because this is a very abstract mathematical theory of consciousness, but it's not completely divorced from experiments on consciousness. Um, in fact, it's one of the more successful theories um, experimentally, um, although you don't want to take that too far. It's certainly not confirmed by existing experimental evidence. Nonetheless, approximations to its key measures have been developed and are now used um, quite successfully to, for example, detect whether or not someone is dreaming or not, whether or not um, some anesthetics has done, it, done its job and selectively erased consciousness, um, and so on and so forth. Um, that's what the image is um, here on the right-hand side of your screen, the so-called perturbation complexity index. Um, we can talk more about that if you're interested in Q&A, but I just raise that to mention that there is an experimental connection uh, to IIT. Okay, so what I want to focus a little bit more on is some of the mathematical details of integrated information theory. Um, now, I'm not going to go through any calculations because those are extremely tedious, even for this example that we have here, which is the simplest non-zero phi system, uh, system AB, a little swap dyad composed of these two elements A and B, that swap binary states. Even for a system like this, which is the simplest non-zero phi system, it takes some time to calculate its Q shape and its big phi. We do that in the appendix of our paper. So all I'm going to do here is just tell you what the key mathematical objects are that are used in those calculations and then provide the results. So if we're going to analyze a system like this, we break it down into its two elements, A and B. It's got four possible states. Um, on, 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 off, off, on, off, off. And we can break it down into three subsystems, A, B, and A, B. So the IIT algorithm will associate with each subsystem two probability distributions over A, B's state space, which we can just call P and P prime. Now, what is this trying to capture? This theory is trying to capture what's called integrated information. So the two probability distributions for, say, system B. One is meant to capture the information that system A has about its immediate past. So given the state that it's in and what it does, what can you predict about the past state of the system? The other probability distribution concerns its immediate future. So that's information and integrated information theory. Um, then uh, the algorithm also assigns a weight to each subsystem. 
And this is derived from a distance measure between two probability distributions. And so this is a way of calculating the so-called integrated information. Um, and again, if you want further details on, on how that works, happy to talk about that. But you get this from a distance measure between two probability distributions. It's represented by small phi. And if you go through the calculations for this particular system, um, uh, uh, subsystem A and subsystem B both get 0.5, AB gets zero. So with that information, we can then construct the Q shape of AB. The relevance of the Q shape, that's the qualia shape of the system, that's meant to represent its total state of consciousness. So that's the relevant mathematical entity for us. So what's the Q shape of a system like AB? Well, each subsystem is assigned a weighted location L derived from those two probability distributions P and P prime. Um, so that's going to give us um, really a point in an eight dimensional space. So remember, it's a um, four possible states, two probability distributions over that. So that's going to be eight dimensions. And so I've just given the results there. We've got a location for A, 0 0.5, 0 0.5, and so on. And then it's weights. So that's what the Q shape looks like. And that's how this theory of consciousness will represent a total state of consciousness of a system. And again, these, these values are derived um, just by looking at the physical properties of the system using the algorithm, you derive these results. So the Q shape is the important one here. I'll just briefly mention also you can calculate big phi, which again is the amount of consciousness in a given system. And system AB is the minimal non-conscious, uh, sorry, the minimal conscious system. So there's a distance measure between Q shapes um, EMD star, which stands for Extended Earth Movers Distance Measure. Um, again, if you want details, we can talk about it later, but it provides a distance measure between Q shapes, which um, is important because it helps us to talk about the difference between two Q shapes. Just like in, say, Pearl's model, you've got a, a measure of the distance between two mass density distributions, which can play a role in speeding up or slowing down the collapse process. Okay, so um, that's just to give you an idea of just what some of the mathematical tools are in the integrated information theory. If you do want to look at um, what, how the, what the calculations look like, again, uh, we can talk about it in Q&A or there's the appendix. Um, okay, so this is obviously very classical. How do you convert this into operators? Well, in recent years, um, there's been a number of researchers, um, you know, so uh, Dave mentioned Zanardi et al., Johannes Kleiner and uh, Sean Toll. Um, they've been developing quantum integrated information theory. So they've been looking at Tononi's integrated information theory and thinking about um, what's this going to look like if you try and capture the basic idea in quantum mechanical terms. And very basically, your, your, your elements are now quidits and you replace the classical probability distributions um, remember, two probability distributions for every subsystem. They're going to get replaced with a couple of density operators assigned to each subsystem. And in order to calculate the small phi value, um, you replace the classical distance measure with the trace distance between density operators. Um, otherwise, it's largely similar. So those are the ma major replacements that are put forward by uh, Zanardi, Kleiner, and Toll. Um, so that's going to enable us to formulate a collapse operator. And this formulation, uh, we should give credit here to Johannes Kleiner, uh, who really helped us uh, develop this. I think Johannes is here in the audience. So if there's difficult questions about quantum integrated information theory, we, we, we may shoot those over to Johannes. Um, anyway, so how do we formulate this collapse operator? Well, any density operator can be re represented in terms of these um, coefficients, Cij. So then we can define our Q shape as consisting in two N sets of these coefficients where N is the number of subsystems and then N non-negative real numbers which correspond to the, to the small phi values that I mentioned before. And, and we're going to uh, duplicate those in the um, operator for convenience. Um, and so here in the, in the middle of the slide is our collapse operator. And of course, we have many of these. Um, in fact, for the simple two element system, you're going to have, I think, was it 96 um, of 96 collapse operators of this form. 
Okay, so that's what the collapse operator looks like. There's um, an additional restriction here where the sum is restricted to this particular class. So E is just um, quantum integrated information theories mapped from quantum networks to Q shapes. C is a class of what we'll call quasi-classical Q shapes. They are what correspond to classical IIT Q shapes and therefore states of consciousness. So one reason for doing this is that while Zanardi et al, Kleiner and Toll have figured out how to formulate integrated information theory in these quantum mechanical terms, it's not immediately clear how the Q shapes of quantum integrated information theory connect to consciousness. So that's one of the reasons for uh, doing this. And so uh, E inverse C is the pre-image of C under E so that we're restricting this to um, the Q shapes corresponding to classical IIT, which draws a connection to actual total states of consciousness. Okay, so with that said, if we have our collapse operator, we can now plug it in to equation one that we had at the beginning of the talk. Um, so here we've just abbreviated alpha for the um, I, J and K indexes that we had in the, in the collapse operator from before. So I know it's a little bit complicated, but what's the purpose of this? What are we trying to achieve? Well, now the idea is if there's little difference in the superposed Q shapes, then uh, the left-hand side term after the equal sign, which is the Schrodinger term, that's going to dominate. Whereas if there is a bit of a difference between these Q shapes, then the collapse terms, the second and third terms will dominate. And um, in which case the system is going to collapse towards the joint eigenstates of the collapse operators at a rate proportional to their eigenvalue differences. And we've added uh, lambda here as well to have an effect. Okay, so those are the dynamics. So insofar as we have a clear enough dynamics, so remember that was um, one of the goals was to try and get a theory that's sufficiently precise. And there are obvious limitations. I mentioned that both classical and quantum integrated information theory are restricted to certain sorts of systems. Nonetheless, um, you might think it's precise enough if we can get some experimental tests out of the theory. And the way of doing that, or one way of doing that, will be to think about what are the simplest um, conscious systems according to this theory. What are the simplest big five systems according to this theory that actually have non-trivial Q shapes. And so we've mentioned uh, this feedback system, the system AB where um, they're set up to swap their states. Um, so one could look to see if this system has been put into a superposition of states, for example, by quantum computers. Um, and there's various suggestions that this you know, could have been done already in the literature. If you look at the so-called quantum Friedkin gate, it's coming pretty close to uh, this feedback network and it has been superposed. Um, there's also research on so-called quantum coherent feedback. So there's a, a distinction in the uh, quantum computing literature between uh, measurement-based feedback and quantum coherent feedback. Measurement-based feedback is where the observer who, or the experimenter who gets an outcome from their system feeds it back into the system, which is not gonna be good enough here, but quantum coherent feedback is where you've got feedback in a quantum system independently of um, the observer's measurement. And so there's a potential source for testing this theory. And some of this stuff has been instantiated already. So it could be that very simple versions of this theory have already been experimentally excluded. Um, in the paper, we talk mostly about these feedback systems. IIT um, predicts that the more feedback there is in a, in a network, the greater the phi, the more complex the Q shape. Um, but there are also certain sorts of feed forward systems that may well be easier to implement in quantum computers, where if you have overlapping inputs and outputs, um, then that can generate some non-zero big phi and therefore some consciousness in the system. Okay, so that's the um, theory. So I'll just sum up um, and say, as, as Dave said, to repeat what Dave said, that are, the results are pretty mixed. What we were hoping for was something fairly clear and simple. Um, um, and it seems we've got something with a relatively clear dynamics. Um, perhaps it's precise enough to enable us to start thinking about experimental predictions, but it's certainly not as simple or as powerful as the standard measurement framework. 
it yields consciousness superpositions. So remember the one that didn't, the version that didn't face the quantum Zeno problem as Dave described. Um, to get out of that, we need subtle consciousness superpositions. And there's a big question as to how to make sense of those. And um, which is something we have a, a section on in the paper. Um, I've mentioned that some versions might already be experimentally falsified, um, but it seems others remain open to um, further experiment. Um, in the collapse theories, you can control the speed at which the um, state vectors in the superposition play gambler's ruin. That is, you can con control the speed of continuous collapse. And so you can, if there's a version of the theory that's already experimentally falsified, you can sort of see that more as a, a say, an experimental bound on how quick the collapse should be. So presumably there is going to be versions of the theory still open. Um, okay, so it does get a little bit messy, but arguably what we've at least provided here is a kind of existence proof that you've got something relatively precise as a consciousness collapse model. Surely um, there's ways of doing better, so we invite others to do better if possible. Um, either way, if we've convinced you of anything in this talk, hopefully we've convinced you that there is a research program here. And insofar as these theories have not been excluded, um, it looks like this research program deserves attention. Okay, I'll finish there and sorry about some of the technical issues, but thanks for listening. Thanks so much, Dave and Kelvin. Um, so you actually finished uh, a little earlier than I'd expected. Um, I would like to give people a good five minute break before we move on to the full question uh, and answer and discussion period, but we have five minutes for some immediate uh, questions and feedback. I see there are already a bunch of hands that are raised. Uh, the first hand I have is from Rob and then I have Wayne. So Rob, why don't you go first? Um, yes, um, my question is how far down the phylogenetic tree does one go with consciousness? You might say that uh, it, as far as the integrated information model goes, uh, but I'll then ask you the question, how far does that model go? Could it end up making plants look like they're conscious? I would say standard IIT absolutely says that consciousness is ubiquitous. Uh, yeah, any plant is going to have networks within it so that there's going to be some degree of uh, some degree of consciousness. So if you go with standard IIT, then it's uh, yeah, pretty close to all the way back on the phylogenetic tree. Um, that said, you know the general approach that we're uh, we're taking here is meant to be consistent with a lot of other approaches other than IIT, but one very simple variation, as Kelvin said, the simple straight IIT combined with collapse, we think it may be already empirically refuted. One simple variation is just to take IIT with a threshold and say only when phi is above a certain quantity will you get consciousness. And then depending how you set that threshold, which will be something like a fundamental constant, then you can get very different locations on the phylo phylogenetic tree, might be uh, the point where consciousness comes in and in the end, that's in principle empirically testable by the kinds of methods Kelvin was talking about, you know, interference experiments and the like. You might also just briefly mention there's, you know, a lot of the IIT model, I, it's complicated. It's not difficult, but it's a little tedious. There's a lot of bells and whistles to it. There is a postulate in the theory called the exclusion postulate, where when you look at a system, you're calculating phi at different levels, different meteorological levels. And, um, so for example, in the case of a plant, you can calculate the phi of the collection of cells that, com that compose the plant, and it might be a non-zero phi suggesting that the plant is conscious, but you then can calculate the phi inside a given cell. And if the phi inside a given cell is greater than the phi of the entire collection of cells, then the consciousness of the plant is excluded in favor of the consciousness of the cell. And Tononi has speculated that perhaps a plant is more like a colony of conscious beings rather than a conscious being in and of itself. All right, thanks. Thank you. Great. So we have time right now for one more question and then we'll pause for uh, a break and then we'll move on to the discussion and question and answer. The next hand I have is Wayne. Okay, thank you, David and um, Kelvin for this. Um, this is interesting, and as you know, I like collapse theories, and I'm happy to see people taking them seriously. Um, but you're reading that, you know, um, 
just watching this, I'm just wondering why I, I should take something like this to be preferable to something like a standard version of CSL with mass density and stuff like that. And one of the thing, motivations that David mentioned was that um, consciousness should be super resistant. And I think the most people who work within the standard thing, um, okay, question, because I know nothing at all about or next to nothing about the physical correlates of consciousness, but I think most people think that this on the standard collapse theories, that's already true. So like, there was some discussion, um, you know, at, at a certain point about, um, you know, if, um, you know, you know, can can the brain be in a, in a um, superposition of seeing two um, me measurement results? And Girardi and his cap, his um, his coworkers, you know, did a rough calculation and thought, okay, different retinal images um, will produce different currents in the optic nerves, and that'll be enough. So, like, is that sort of received wisdom correct on the basis of you know? People, people who know more about neuro, neuroscience and also our standard collapse theories, the neural correlates of consciousness are, are um, super superposition resistant. Yeah, I would say that's close enough to being correct for our purposes. Important point, we're not in this talk trying to argue against, against any other interpretations okay. or to argue that this interpretation is superior to any, any other interpretation. We're just trying to get it on the table. It may well be that others are superior for CSL in particular. Um, yeah, you're certainly right that CSL gives a nice story about how any macroscopic system is gonna end up resisting superposition at least of, of mass densities. There are interesting issues about whether some other observable other than mass density might lead to, might lead to trouble with conscious observation. But aside from that, yeah, we're not trying to invoke superiority here. We just say there's one particular theoretical virtue here which is giving a, uh, a causal role for uh, for consciousness in particular in the story, as opposed to just, hey, brains will collapse, um, brains will lead to collapse. Furthermore, it may turn out that before, there's this whole empirical project of, of empirically refuting every, every version of CSL and GRW and so on. So I fully expect that within a few decades, they will all be refuted, but then these other ones will still be on the table. Yeah, I don't Thanks. think this is superior to CSL either. Um, I'm sympathetic with many worlds. I'm just deeply curious about this. Um, and if we could just falsify it, experimentally exclude it, that would be, I think, very interesting. Great. All right. So thanks for uh, questions. Uh, thanks again to Dave and Kelvin for their wonderful talk. So thank you very much. Um, we're going to take uh, a five minute break and then we'll reconvene for the general discussions and question and answer. I have, like I said, carefully kept track of everybody's hands who've been up for the past three talks and they'll get priority uh, for the, uh, the final hour of discussion. So we'll reconvene here uh, at a minute after the hour. <laughs>